welcome to Arthritis at Home. My name is Ellen and I'm the Programs Coordinator at Arthritis Consumer Experts. Today I'm joined by a colleague from Arthritis Research Canada, Megan Thomas, who is a PhD candidate and recently won a huge Canadian award for her research that looks specifically at the question of equity when we access or what are the differences in access, I should say, for different diverse groups across Canada. She is supervised by Dr. Mary DeVera and Dr. Mark Harrison. And today I get to ask her a little bit about this really exciting research and maybe hint at possible ways that all of us can get involved. So Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Megan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, how you got involved in rheumatology research? Of course. So uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate. I'm at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UBC in Vancouver, um, where I specialize in epidemiology and health outcomes. But I did all of my previous training in Calgary. Uh, so I did my undergrad degree in health sciences, specializing more in public health. And then I did my master's in community health sciences, where I specialize more in health services research. Um, and it was through my undergraduate program where I was introduced into the world of research, uh, even though like everyone at the time I was kind of planning to go into medicine, I realized that through research I could have the opportunity to look more at the bigger picture um, and have a more upstream approach to looking at the root causes of different conditions and outcomes. So I ended up taking a year off after that undergrad and I was able to work as a research coordinator for Dr. Glenn Hazelwood, uh, a rheumatologist at the University of Calgary. And so he actually introduced me to the field of rheumatology um, and he supported me to do my master's with him where I was exploring how to include patient preferences in clinical trial design within rheumatology. So yeah, I really credit Dr. Hazelwood for that, but it, I just really liked the field of rheumatology and the opportunity to work with people who have lived experience on the research team. It's a beautiful story, and I can see how, you know, going from science background then to a community health background, and then to what we call health services research, um, has really led you to where you are now in Vancouver. I'm glad we got to spill, <laughs> spill you away from Calgary. Not that Calgary uh, isn't awesome, but for you to <laughs> And can I ask why specifically the interest in health equity and you know, more specifically, I'm curious, like, did you see, for example, a difference when you were working with Dr. Hazelwood or mm -hmm. a difference when you were working in community health that you're like, this, this kind of seems slightly off, right? Was there that moment yeah. for you? Yeah, there definitely was. So it was through my undergrad program where I learned about the social determinants of health. Um, and so that really, really just got my interest, um, thinking about the different life factors for why we actually are often getting sick and kind of the reasons why people get sick are not typically just the biological and the genetics. It actually has a lot more to do with the things that we do every day and the conditions in which we live and work. Um, so this was very aligned with that concept of health equity and then thinking about why people have different health outcomes. So through my work with Dr. Hazelwood, I was also able to collaborate with uh, Dr. Cheryl Barnaby, who we all know is a very well-established health equity researcher within rheumatology. Um, and so that allowed me to begin thinking about how health equity can impact people with rheumatic conditions, which I think just thinking of the chronic nature of rheumatic conditions, it felt very important to think about this concept of equity and having different health outcomes and how can we improve um, kind of conditions of life for people within this field. So um, that combined with getting the opportunity to work with people who have lived experience have helped me develop a more of that passion for pursuing health equity further in my PhD. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, because you got to take that year off and I did as myself as well. Um, so that story does absolutely resonate with me. But you realize, for example, when we think about health outcomes, right, that is what happens downstream, but does not tell us the story of what happens upstream. So, for example, we now know because of Dr. Cheryl Barnaby's work that certain groups, especially certain groups that are Indigenous, we also know certain groups, for example, in lupus, mm -hmm. uh, we know that Asian people of Asian descent are of higher likelihood of having mm -hmm. lupus, right? 
So not only is there a high likelihood and then it's harder to access care, so we end up, you know, further along in disease progression, which we don't want. Progression in this case is not good, right? <laughs> yeah. We don't want progression. And then we see the outcomes, which are loss mm -hmm. of physical function or a yeah. high cost in terms of healthcare expenditure to take care of these individuals who were dealt a bad hand, didn't mm -hmm. get the care they needed, and then didn't, you know, we're, we're really left with no choices in this case. Yeah, yeah, it's really like a vicious cycle, right? Yeah. Exactly. Understanding what we mean by health equity is the, are we able to look at this picture, not just the downstream differences, mm -hmm. but like this entire picture. And um, now tell us about uh, the Progress Plus and maybe uh, mm -hmm. use, use the social determinants of health, uh, maybe as a primer to help us mm -hmm. understand what the Progress Plus is. Sure. Yeah. So the Progress Plus framework was developed by Campbell and Cochran's Equity Methods Group. Um, so they're actually using it to report different social determinants of health, which can be risk factors that lead to inequities in health. So the PROGRESS stands for, it's a very long acronym, so I apologize, but it's place of residence, race, culture, ethnicity, language, occupation, gender, sex, religion, education, socioeconomic status, and social capital, plus um, some other factors that could kind of not be considered part of those categories, but to better encompass everything that might affect uh, health inequities. So looking at different personal characteristics that might be associated with discrimination, looking at features of relationships, and then time-dependent relationships. Um, so the Progress Plus framework is really kind of the guiding uh, framework for my thesis. And this is because it allows me to stratify different health outcomes and opportunities that could impact people with inflammatory arthritis. Yeah. And I think it's so wonderful because it sets a standard for researchers in mm -hmm. terms of reporting, because the issue previously is we we did these big studies, these randomized control trials. They cost a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and we said they had 250 people. OK. And then they had a super positive outcome. Wow. This is the <laughs> best intervention ever. And then when we take that intervention and we translate it to so my field, knowledge translation, Mm -hmm. translate it into the real world and we take it to actual communities it doesn't end up working and you're like yeah oh, weird <laughs> and when you go back to the original study in which we built mm -hmm. that evidence you find out well those individuals were all of high socioeconomic status mm -hmm. had access to care they had access to support yes. their families were available to support them mm -hmm. their friend networks were there and hence, is it the intervention that worked? Or is it you could have given this individual any intervention and they would have improved their health outcomes, right? So it really mm -hmm. allows researchers to say, is this intervention not only going to work, but is it going to work in the diverse contexts, populations, and groups, and with individuals, mm -hmm. real people in the real yeah. world? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, uh, because we did do a series of scoping reviews where we were trying to synthesize randomized control trials in Canada for different rheumatic conditions. And we were trying to use this Progress Plus framework to characterize uh, the participants of these studies and look at how determinants of health inequities might be reported or if they're reported at all. And it was like you said, so our findings showed very limited reporting of these determinants of health inequities. And then overall, just a lack of diversity in the research participant samples. So it definitely is a problem that we need to fix. Now tell us, Megan, your next step. So after a review, so a review is where you mm -hmm. pretty much look at the literature, what's been done, and then you synthesize. Yes. So you've done some synthesis, right? You yes. describe the state of the current literature. Now you mm -hmm. you uh, you have some interviews. Right? Can you can you tell I us do. about? <laughs> what kind of interviews and why why are you conducting interviews? Sure. So yeah, based on what we found with our reviews, we wanted to then explore, okay, how do we include equity, diversity, and inclusion or these EDI principles in research within Canada? So kind of the first step is to look at how is EDI in rheumatology research currently being considered in Canada through the people who are conducting this research. So we're planning to interview um, clinician scientists and rheumatology researchers 
really with the goal of exploring their perspectives on the current climate um, of research within Canada, but then to more importantly identify facilitators to help improve uh, the development and kind of the inclusion of EDI in rheumatology research. Um, so these findings will be very important for the next phase of our research, which will be more of the focus groups with people who actually have lived experience um, with rheumatic conditions. And there we want to identify the motivation of why people do or don't participate in research, and then um, to identify more effective strategies to help recruit participants that we usually don't hear from or who might not typically uh, be heard from in rheumatology research. Beautiful, Megan. And I see the progression of, of how your thesis really does build on, on the work. Um, <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> that is the goal for us PhD students. We have to uh, have a beautiful narrative in our, in our work. And we hope that, you know, we are able to truly contribute to a field and do something novel. Mm -hmm. So this is really exciting to hear about. <laughs> And then finally, you're going to end with a survey. And I, I asked about this because mm. ACE has conducted a survey on health inequities, and we found some okay. really interesting things. So I'm, I'm highly confident that you will also find some really interesting information. Yeah, I'm excited. I think, um, you know, back when I was like applying to the PhD, this was kind of the main part of the project. It's just that we realized we would have to take a step back and do some qualitative work to you know, better identify recruitment strategies so that we're not always hearing from the same people. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of one of the goals of the survey is hopefully that through our cumulative findings from the qualitative work, we can utilize the suggested recruitment strategies and be able to see if they were actually more effective in having a more diverse sample. Um, but then the overarching kind of main goal of conducting the survey will be to look at how different equity risk factors from that progress plus framework could maybe impact health outcomes for um, people with rheumatic conditions. So kind of a double-edged goal there, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yeah, I'm excited to, to see what we find. We really need the work and I'm grateful mm -hmm. that I know somebody, I know the person who gets to dig into it <laughs> and I know that you will be recruiting at some point. So Megan, if someone mm -hmm. wants to get involved in, for example, these focus groups that will yeah. take place um, where you ask people with lived experiences, so individuals living with rheumatic mm -hmm. disease, right, about their access to care, um, mm -hmm. where do they find this information or how can they kind of, you know, stay in the loop? Yeah, so this is kind of a stay tuned and I'll let you know. Of course, you can always reach out to me directly if you're listening to this um, through my email, which I think Ellen can provide. But I think we're going to do, you know, the traditional approach with social media, um, different postings with arthritis affiliated groups. But we want to be a little bit more creative and actually reach out to communities and go to where people get their information, because we suspect that's why we don't typically hear from certain groups and why groups may be underrepresented. So kind of looking at going to different, you know, community centers and places of worship, um, you know, just like through the community. Uh, so stay tuned. We're going to try to <laughs> apply a lot of different recruitment strategies to, to see if we can actually um, recruit people who maybe don't often get the opportunity to participate in a focus group like this and be heard um, because they haven't heard about the opportunity to. Really well said. And, you know, for everyone to keep in mind, if you're listening right now and you're like, I know a good way that I, as an individual, would like to reach out to my community. You have an idea. If that's a library, Right. Yeah, if, please. Uh, <laughs> you know, a social group at this location where you have a gardening club. Megan mm -hmm. wants to know about these things. So please, <laughs> please, please, we will link a way to contact her uh, below this video. So please reach out and give her these ideas because I, I will say as somebody kind of who has dabbled and kind of straddled this field yeah. as well, no one's done this before. So there aren't like other research where methods of this is how you recruit individuals that are <laughs> not well served or seldom heard. There aren't methods for us to follow. So if you have, yeah. idea, we want to know. Um, and yeah, if you want to be involved in Megan's research, please reach out to her. We will, Megan, we will definitely give you a hand when the time comes to do a recruit <laughs> push. Um, but with that, Megan, thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. And we do wish you all the best. Thank you so much for having me. With that, 
Take care, everyone. And we hope to catch you on the next episode at Arthritis Home.